What's up, guys? On today's episode, we see Jesus, our kinsman redeemer. What's up, guys? This is your boy, Damien, coming to you with another episode of the Last Things Podcast, where we are on a journey to truth. Last week, we covered the rest of chapter four, where we went into the throne of God. And today, we're still in the throne of God, but now we have, it, it, it's crunch time, so to speak. This is where things start to get a little heavy now. Now John is there and there's a certain situation that's going on that we're going to look at today. I, um, last week, I think I titled this Jesus, oh, I'm sorry, Jesus, our kinsman redeemer. So we're going to kind of stick with that. Um, let's read it first and then I'll explain where we're going today because we're going to have to take a little trip to see certain things that I think might apply. Um Let's look at Revelation chapter five. And I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one sitting who was sitting of the one who was sitting on the throne. There was writing on the inside and the outside of the scroll and it was sealed with seven seals. And I saw and I saw a strong angel who shouted with a loud voice who was worthy to break the seals on the scroll and unroll it. But. No one in heaven or on earth or underneath earth was able to open the scroll and read it and read it. I'm sorry. Uh, Verse four says, then I wept because no one could be found who was worthy to open the scroll and read it. Now. Paraphrase of what we just read. John says God has a scroll in his right hand. This angel says who is worthy to open the scrolls and loose the seals thereof. John begins to cry because he said there was no man. Let's see what he said. He said there was no, where we went to. Verse four, then I wept because no one could be found who was wor- who is worthy to open the scroll. I'm sorry, that's not where I went. Verse two. Who is worthy to open the scroll to open to break the seals on this scroll and unroll it? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and read it. John said, nobody in heaven, no man in heaven. That's key. We said, no man in heaven, no man on earth or under the earth. Under the earth, of course, if he said no man in heaven, and that means under the earth, no man in hell. So that's what that means. So there's a scroll. Let's deal with that scroll first. This scroll that is in the right hand, that, uh, the description of it, it's sealed with seven seals. And John made sure to know that we see, that we know that there's writing on the inside and the outside of this scroll. Now, we have seen scrolls that have writing on the inside and the outside. We've seen one in Ezekiel chapter two, verse nine through 10. It says this, then I looked and saw a hand reaching out to me. It held a, it, it held a scroll, which he unrolled. And I saw that both sides were covered with the in, New Living Translation says funeral songs, words of sorrow and pronouncements of doom. But King James says lamentations and something. Let me see if I can pull the translation up in King James so we can see what it says. I think it's lamentations and woes. I think that's what it says in King James. But let's look at it to be on the safe side. Y'all know I don't like to butcher the word of God. So 
And when I looked, behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. And there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. He's basically, this scroll had judgments on it. That's what that means. Basically, basically it's a scroll of judgments. That's why it said lamentations, mourning, and woe. This is a scroll of judgment that Ezekiel had. Now, the angel tells Ezekiel to eat the scroll. So you have to read the rest of it to see what Ezekiel, what, the, what he's told. And I'm not going to say angel because I really believe it was God who was speaking to him. It's Ezekiel chapter two, if you want to read in your study time. So that's one place we saw one. Then there's one in Zechariah, I believe. I think it's Zechariah, but that one, that one's something else. So I'm not going to really discuss that one. Now, there's a working theory. This is a theory about what's going on in Revelation 5. This is where most people, everybody pretty much is leaning towards because everybody speculates on what, what, what this means. But I've heard this before, and I, I heard this actually taught by Chuck Missler himself. Hey, let me tell y'all something. If y'all want to know, read a uh, study of end times and you want to listen to it, besides me, listen to Chuck Missler. That man, Lord have mercy, man, that man there is a, is a worth, a well of knowledge. Man, I mean, some of his teachings on end time prophecy that I listen to it. You when I'm work, when I'm at work, I listen to him. I'm just blown away. Like, wow, I, it's just so amazing. Of course, he passed away many years ago, but man, that dude there was just excellent. I, I recommend anybody to listen to Chuck Missler. I, I def, I highly recommend it. But anyway. I was listening to one of his videos and he explained the theory that I'm going to explain to you. He explained it. And I was like, that can't be right. No, I didn't understand it. But as I began to study and read and research, I found out this is what a lot of people are leaning towards what's going on here in Revelation 5. So I'm going to explain it to you so that you can go back in your study time to look over it yourself because this is an opinion. And I'm going to give you an opinion about this scroll when I finish explaining this theory because what's the tagline of this podcast? A journey to truth. So a lot of teachings out there you guys might not know. It's my job to tell you because it's out there for you. So it won't be fresh to you. You'll look like, oh, I've heard about, I've heard of that before. And like I said, this is the prevailing theory of what everybody believes is going on here in Revelation 5. So with that being said, now let's go to the Old Testament because this is where we got to go. We got to go two places in the Old Testament. Let's first go back to Jeremiah chapter 32. Actually three. We're going to come back to, um, we're going to come to one of them later. Let's go to Jeremiah 32. I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it for time's sake, but you can go back and read it in your study time, all right? So in Jeremiah 32, um, Jeremiah is in prison. He's in prison because he told the king at the time, hey, God's going to punish you guys. God's going to punish you. He's going to punish you. So they threw him in jail. I'm paraphrasing, guys. Read in your study time, Jeremiah 32. So he's in jail. While he's in jail, God tells him, hey, your cousin is going to come see you. He's going to tell you, buy this land from me. Buy the land that he wants to sell to you. So within a few minutes of what God says, his cousin shows up. I don't think y'all, uh, I think y'all missed that. 
God tells Jeremiah exactly what's going to happen. A few minutes later, exactly what he told Jeremiah exactly happened the exact same way. The Bible says he watches over his word to perform it. I'm telling you this because there's some of you out there who feel like God has told you something and it has not come to pass. Don't believe that. We see here, God said it and instantly, it, and it happened. Remember in Genesis, God said, let there be, and it was. So what I'm telling you is, if God has told you something, if he's told you he's going to do something, if he told you he's going to open a door, if he told you he's going to make a way, if he told you he's going to deliver, whatever God told you, you can bank on he's going to do exactly what he said. So don't fret about it. Don't worry about how long it's taken. If God said it, he's going to do it. All right. So now um, as we as um, as we keep going. So Jeremiah's cousin shows up as God said, and he tells him, hey, buy this land for me that I'm selling. Once this happened, Jeremiah says, OK, and he buys the land. Because this happened the exact way God told him it was going to happen. So he did it. He buys the land. He sells it for 17 shekels. I think that's what they called it. Again, I'm paraphrasing it. Jeremiah 32. Read it. So he buys the land. He, get, he, uh, he pays for it. And they make two copies. They make a copy of a deed. They make two copies of the deed. One copy is sealed up. Another copy is not sealed, but it's put not sealed, but it's open for anybody to see. Now they now Jeremiah tells them to, they are told to take both copies, put in a jar, and I guess bury it for when. For right now, what's happening is the children of Israel are about to go into the 70 year of Babylonian exile. So what God is doing is he had Jeremiah buy this land. So when they come out of the 70 year exile, they have this land. God tells them you'll be you'll see them buy property and everything else on this land. And then as Jeremiah, and if you keep reading in Jeremiah 32, he begins to ask God why or why, how to do this or whatever. And God tells him, is there anything too hard for me? So that's a summary of Jeremiah 32. Now, I know you're going to ask the question, well, what happened to Jeremiah's land? Honestly, I really don't know because I've looked for it all through. I've been researching it for the last few days. The last thing that I saw was his, the name of his hometown was Ananath. I think that's the name of it. Let me see. Can I pull it up here? Oh, I can't because I didn't pull up the scripture. I think the name of it is Anna, Ananath, A-N-A-T-H-O-T-H. -T -T that's his hometown today. It is known as Anata, A-N-A-T-A. That's what it's named today. Now, from, I guess, just from what I, little bit of what I found, it's possible that it went to the tribe of Benjamin. I'm not really sure because it's not, everything is really fuzzy about what happened to that land. It's even fuzzy about Jeremiah because Jeremiah, if what I found was it's true, Jeremiah never goes into the land. He's he was stoned to death. So he never saw God fulfill this promise to him. So that's that's the research that I found. It's very sketchy about what happened to the land. I'm still looking at it myself as far as what happened to the land that he purchased. So now let's keep that in mind about the scroll written on both sides being a D. Let's keep that in mind and look at the transaction between Jeremiah and his cousin. His cousin comes to him to buy this land. Now, basically, Jeremiah would have been 
a kinsman redeemer, which now takes us to the second place that we need to go to. We need to go to the book of Ruth. Y'all know the book of Ruth. All you single women always, oh, I need to find my Boaz. I can't wait to find my Boaz, my Boaz. If it's one book, any, any single woman will know, oh, they all know the book of Ruth. So we're here at the book of Ruth. I'm paraphrasing it, reading your study time. Now, Naomi's husband, Imelech, passes away. 10 years later, his two sons pass away. Naomi tells Ruth and Orpah, hey, my, my, my children are gone go home to your, uh, go back to your homes. Or Pa cries and she really didn't want to, but after a while she went on and went home. Ruth, however, told Naomi, I'm not leaving. I'm going to stay here with you. Your God will become my God. So I'm not leaving. So after a while, Naomi tells Ruth, okay, let's go. So they go back to they go back to the roots to Naomi's hometown. Now, as Ruth is out working, Boaz shows up and he sees her and he instantly begins to take a liking to her. Now, uh they end up having dinner, I believe. And when when Ruth came, well, Ruth was working. When she came back, Naomi said, where'd you get all this stuff from? And she told her, hey, I ran into a man named Boaz. And Naomi says, oh, he's one of our kinsmen redeemers. So after, you know, they go, then later on, I'm paraphrasing it, y'all. Later on, Naomi tells Ruth what to do to approach Boaz because they wanted Boaz to redeem Naomi's land. Remember how the role of a kinsman redeemer is when someone passes away, the person can get a person uh, pass away or they want to give their land to somebody else. A kinsman redeemer, somebody in the land, somebody in the family can come in and take the land from them. So the land will stay in the family, which is what Jeremiah's cousin did with Jeremiah. Jeremiah was his cousin's kinsman redeemer. He wanted him to redeem the land. Now, know what y'all thinking about that redeem the land. I'm going to come back to that part in a little bit. We'll get to our uh, next stop. So, um, Ruth, so Ruth goes in to Boaz's place where he was sleeping, and she does exactly what Naomi told her to do. Boaz says, there's another, pretty much after them talking, Boaz says, there's another kinsman redeemer that's closer to, that's closer to you than me. I need to talk to him first. If he does not, if he agree, if he does not redeem the land, then I will redeem the land and I'll marry you. So the next day, Boaz goes to meet the other kinsman redeemer. We never know his name. The scripture doesn't say what his name was. So they have a meeting. They got the witnesses around. Same thing as Jeremiah had witnesses. So they go in, had the meeting. Boaz tells him he wants to redeem the land, but he can't do it because uh, this other was first. So the other one was like, okay, yeah, I, I'll redeem it. And Boaz says, okay, but if you redeem the land, you have to marry Ruth. That way she can have kids that will, the land will stay in, that it'll stay in, that the land will stay within the family after they're long gone. The guy was like, oh no, I can't marry Ruth. So you can redeem the land. So Boaz, um, so after the transaction, they do some couple of things. Hey, it's out in the witnesses. They know Boaz has the right to redeem the land. And that's what he does. He marries Ruth. Now, and so I'm just paraphrased it. Now, we got scroll writing on both sides, title deed in Jeremiah. We have kinsman redeemer, land in family. Kinsman redeemer comes along renews the land, right? Okay, look at Leviticus 25. Let's look at Leviticus 25. First of all, look at 23. The land must never be sold on a permanent basis for the land which belongs to me, for the land belongs to me. You are only foreigners and tenant farmers working for me. This is God telling the children, you can never sell this land. On a permanent basis, God tells them, this is my land. 
y'all just working for me. So that's why if anybody was getting ready to ask me, um, why can't they just sell it to somebody else? This is why, because God told them, you can't sell my land, it's mine. So let's look at 25. If one of your fellow Israelites falls into poverty and is forced to sell some family land, then a close relative should buy it back for him. Doesn't that sound like Naomi? Naomi's husband passed away. She has land. She can't afford it. So she's got land that she wants to sell. Now, she wants it to stay in the family. What did it say? A close relative, a kinsman redeemer, Boaz, should be able to buy it back, right? Now, that's verse 25. So... I don't think I don't think we need 26 or 27. Then we just need 25. So this is one of the laws for redemption of the land. Now we got Jeremiah 32. We have Ruth, and we've seen Leviticus, the law, right? We've seen laws of redemption, right? Now let's take all three of these things, and now let's look at Revelation 5. And let's see if this theory really matches up with what's being done, right? Revelation 5, then I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. There was writing on the inside and the outside, and it was sealed with seven seals. What was Jeremiah's scroll? It was a deed. So this could very well be a deed. Now, here's the question. If this is a deed. What is it a deed to? Very simple. It's a deed to the earth. This is the plant. Why am I saying it's a deed to the earth? Let me find this verse. And you know what? I'm gonna come back to that verse as to why it would be it as to the uh the deed. I'm gonna come back to this verse. So let's come back to it. But okay, so. It should be a deed. Now, and I saw an angel who shouted with a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals on this scroll and unroll it. That's in the New Living Translation, right? So one of the three things of a kinsman redeemer, you had to be, you had to be a kin. Notice what they said. Who is worthy to open the seal and break, and who is worthy to break the seals on the scroll and unroll it? Verse four, then I wept because no one could be found. Hold on, I'm sorry, I'm skipping it. Verse three, but no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth. We need to read it in King James. Verse three says this, no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look therein. Now, notice, what did he say? No man, it has to be a man. If this is a kinsman redeemer situation, if this is a deed, first thing, you need a kin. A kin to who? He said a man. What man? It's got to be Adam. Why? Adam is the first man. Remember, man is the original rulers of the earth. Man lost that. We lost that when Adam sinned. First John, remember the scripture I was just getting ready to read to you. And I said, I'll come back to, uh, I think it's, it's, it's John chapter 10. No, I'm sorry. It's John chapter 12. I'm sorry. John chapter 12, verse 32, 30 through 32. Then Jesus tells, then Jesus told them, the voice was for your benefit, not mine. The time for judging this world has come where Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. The Bible, Jesus says Satan rules this world. Why? Because man forfeited it when Adam sinned. So now Satan has taken control of this world. But now, God has the deed, the original deed, God has it. So, kinsman redeemer, you need somebody akin to Adam. Who could that be?
Hey, guys, stay tuned for part two next week as we continue our discussion on Jesus, our kinsman redeemer. Stay tuned for part two next week. Love you guys.